Episode 3 Chicken Shits and Drinking Games Last we left off, the party had infiltrated the Red Brand hideout for a second time. We killed several guards, a few skeletons, and the Nothic while also releasing a family who had been imprisoned by the Red Brands. That night, while we were camping out under the stars, we were attacked by hobgoblins. The cleric and my druid were ultimately knocked unconscious, but everyone survived. Frustrated, the paladin renounced his faith. The next day, once I had healed up a bit, the party decided to infiltrate the hideout one last time to finish the job. This time, we decided to use the entrance to the hideout that was hidden in a ruined building. This old home went up in flames long ago. Taking along the goblin droop that we had met throughout this whole ordeal, we infiltrated one last time. We were greeted by a grand room with several doors to other locations. One door led to a barrack, now void of its residents. Another door led to a storage room filled with supplies and food that we deduced the Red Brands had stolen from the citizens of Fandolin. We take a few things for ourselves, but ultimately use most of the barrels to barricade a door that leads to the cave with the crevasse. We don't want anyone sneaking up behind us. The next room we must travel to has a trap in it, though none of us can deduce where that trap is. All we really know is that it's triggered by a floor panel. This is a long way of saying we failed our perception checks. It's only after Drip the Goblin runs across the room hastily that we realize that the floor panel has to have a certain amount of weight on it to trigger the trap. Droop wasn't heavy enough, so he didn't trigger it. The paladin decides to try to find the floor panel by using one of the barrels in the storage room. He rolls the barrel on its side in front of him until he hits the switch. This switch reveals a ten-foot-wide pit that spans the doorway across the room. Fortunately for us, it's easy to either jump across the pit or shimmy along the sides of the room. Opening the doors at the end of the hall, we find ourselves back in the crypt where we fought the three skeletons. We skip that room and the armory room that we had previously robbed completely clean, and we return to another storage room that's connected to the cave with the crevasse. We know there's another secret door in that storage room, but the entire cave is dark. Not a single light illuminates the place. This makes things very difficult for our human rogue, and we start to suspect that the place might be abandoned. We decide to explore the secret door that we didn't get a chance to look at anyways. Droop, the kind goblin, leads our human rogue with his dark vision. The secret passageway ultimately leads us to a bedroom, and it seems to be the only one that isn't shared by multiple people. The paladin and the cleric also find a tome on the desk in the room. Based on the fact that there's only one bed and this tome, we come to surmise that the room was once owned by Glassstaff, the wizard leader of the Red Brands. He's also the one who hired the Nothic as extra security. Our deduction is further confirmed when we walk into the next room, which turns out to be a laboratory. Based on what we find, the magic users come to find out that Glassstaff was attempting to create a potion that would turn people and items invisible. The only sign of life in the place is a single rat, and when the paladin kills the rat, instead of leaving a body behind, it poofs out of existence. That's when we realized that it was Glassstaff's familiar. There was a good chance that he was watching us through the eyes of the rat the whole time. We panic and we figure that we need to get the hell out of there fast, but we also want to sabotage Glassstaff's work as much as possible. I take some potion components before the entire room is trashed, turning some things in the room invisible, and then I set fire to the whole place, which ends up exploding pretty much everything. The only other place we haven't explored is the common room owned by the orcs and the goblins that the Red Brands had hired. 
We also find that the cave entrance we had previously used had been completely collapsed. We're frustrated that we can't finish the red brands off completely, but we're happy that we got them out of town, and we return as much supplies to the citizens as we can. Once the supplies had been returned to the citizens, the group starts to splinter off to do their own things. The cleric, the rogue, and the ranger go to take rests, while the paladin and I go drinking with one of the lawmakers in town. We end up playing a dice drinking game, and we get pretty drunk. In the end, the lawmaker ultimately leaves, and the paladin and I are left to play the rest of the game by ourselves. I decide to spice things up by saying, whoever loses this game must be the servant to the winner for an entire day. Guess who passed out first? The paladin carries me up to the bathroom and wakes the ranger, telling her that she needs to take care of me. She does so, but she's annoyed by it. Ultimately, she cleans me up and puts me to bed. In the middle of the night, when the ranger is attempting to get her four hours of trance rest in, she smells smoke. When she turns to look at my druid, she finds her sheets smoking, and the scars on her arms and leg are lighting up with fire. The ranger panics and takes me and my sheets to the bathroom to put out the fire with the water. She manages to do this without too much damage being done, but there are still burned marks everywhere. Not to mention the fact that her hands were severely burned. The ranger was unconscious when I explained my backstory to the rest of the party, so she's unsure as to why this happened. The next morning, the ranger does her best to hide her burned hands, but my druid still notices the burn marks on the floor. Emotions heightened by hangover, she begins to freak out. She explains to the ranger what happened in her life and why she ultimately had to leave her home. The ranger comforts my druid, telling her that she will never be forced to leave the party. This is enough to bring my druid to tears and she throws her arm around the ranger, hugging her tightly. It's at this point that the ranger makes it clear she's uncomfortable with hugging. The party begins to plan the next steps over breakfast, knowing that we have three missions left to complete. We start by going to help a family with an apple orchard. Once we're done helping them, the farmer actually asks us to go on another mission for him. And this is where my internet crapped out, so I'm not completely sure what happened after this point. Party members, I know you're watching, so fill in the blanks in the comment section below.